Are we, uh, are you ready for our last speaker today? Yes, All right, everybody's excited. And uh, if you know Tom McVeigh, you ought to be excited. So uh, our next, you know, our next speaker is a Lieutenant Tom McVeigh, retired. Um, who's here uh, with his wife, Alice, of some 56 years, of which they have two sons. I asked Tom for a bio about a month ago. He didn't give me one. <laughs> he didn't give me one, and he didn't give me one until last week we did a run through with the shift, and he heard the impressive bios of the other two guys, so he gave me one. <laughs> It, it's three pages, you know. We went, we went from nothing to three pages. That was impressive. But I, uh, he says, Chief, use what you want. I really don't care. It's not about me, but it is. Okay, it's about all of us because this is uh, the history of the Kanky Fire Department. Is who we are and what makes us who we are, as from a professional standpoint. You know, Tom uh, joined the fire department in um, December 10th, uh, 1958. He was uh, promoted to lieutenant March 13th in 1965. So as I'm reading through this, I see he was promoted to lieutenant in 1976. Again. Uh, again. Well, in, uh, right after he was promoted the first time, he took a little hiatus and moved to California because of his experience in the coroner's office. Is that correct? and went out there to uh, work and then found out that in the land of fruits and nuts, he was better here than out there. <laughs> and so he came back and actually tested again, went through the testing process and got hired again in 1968. Is that correct? Is when you got hired again? Close enough. <laughs> Close enough, 1968 and uh, promoted again in 1976. During that time, uh, Tom, he received several awards. Uh, uh, one being when he and firefighter Jim West, they responded uh, to a serious fire at the old White Front Hotel on Cypress Street. And while searching the smoke-filled uh, building, located an elderly resident uh, in his room on the second floor, carried him to safety down the fire escape in the rear alley where the squad men administered O2 and then the guy got up and proceeded to run away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he uh, and he was recognized in the paper with a picture the same day, uh, Assistant Chief Gimo and Firefighter Warren for their River Rescue Award. So uh, during this time, uh, Tom was instrumental in developing our EMS program, being one of the first uh, uh, firefighters officers to go through school, to get certified, to bring it back to certify others and, um, and get the EMS program started. So we really do appreciate that. And so we don't have anyone uh, better to go ahead and present this program on uh, the, our EMS than uh, Tom McVeigh. One quick story, Blue Mass. If you ever heard of Blue Mass, we have a Blue Mass every year. They just got it over with last weekend. The very first Blue Mass where show we show up at the Knights of Columbus. We were kind of pretty well disorganized at that point. And as I, we start to line up to walk, in walks this guy dressed in his uniform and says, can I walk with you? And it was Tom McVeigh. All right. And I said, Tom, he goes, where do I get in line? I said, you get in line right here with me. For you to do that, uh, it meant a lot to me and uh, it showed how proud you are of your uh, heritage in the fire service and of uh, it showed a true dedicated individual to me. And not only that time, but when we were at the, one other story, we were at Burger King down in Springfield at the uh, dedication of the firefighters memorial. Who do you think walks in? <laughs> Tom McVeigh. While we we're all sitting there and that's, what, is that what you were wearing that day? You were yeah. dressed I could still fit in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but now we need the hat stretcher to, 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 to get it to fit a little bit better. 
I think that you're really going to enjoy this presentation, ladies and gentlemen, Tom McVeigh. To these two guys, there's no way I can compete, so I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it, come on, you can stay. Oh, stay, will you? I got some coffee, I'll be okay. All right, good. Here, let me mic you up. <laughs> Get me up here. And Tom is going to operate his own clicker. <laughs> he doesn't want Dave to do it, so that's all right. <laughs> nah. Did you get demoted, Dave? Yeah. <laughs> Dang. All right, so you've heard this. Now, you've, if you count, I'm 106 years old. Uh, all the stuff that I've done. Uh, I want to start, though, with uh, a disclaimer. Any errors or omissions in this portion are due to advanced age, memory difficulties, and neglect. Uh, I want to mention that many of the pictures in my program are from here at the museum. So if you like old Kanky stuff, this is the place to buy it in their gift shop. Uh, we thank them for their use. And I want to talk first of all about family history because it does transcend down into Kanki Fire Department history. Great grandpa, Roy, uh, John Markworth I, I'll call him, was here at Engine 30 in Chicago Fire Department, 1890. The oldest, it still is the oldest fire station in Chicago. This is his helmet, which you see over there. This would be the rig he was on back in those days. Now there's a driver and the engineer, which he was. When you get to a fire there, the driver's job is to unhook the horses and move them to a place of safety in the weather or whatever. And since there are a lot of horse buggies in those days, there are plenty of garage and stuff that could be done. And the engineer back there, then he stoked the fire some more, operated the pump, the pump gear and stuff to get the fires going to pump the water. Uh, I got to go back, I jumped one here, but anyway, so great grandpa John, 1890, in 1995, he had a son, he and great grandma Teresa, Roy. Uh, great grandpa, the family history is he fell in the host tower at engine 30, died as a result, and great grandma and her two month old child moved to Kankakee to live near her parents. He grew to manhood, and in 1917 joined the Kankakee Fire Department. Here he is at the old number two station, still a wooden joint. Two years later, politics changed and he lost his job, which was kind of the habit in those days. He got a job with the Kankakee State, or the uh, Illinois State Fire Marshal Association as a, a deputy chief. Did that till 1935 when politics changed again, and they brought him back as chief of the department. There he is here. He retired in uh, 53, if I remember correctly. His son, he had three children. My Aunt Vivian, my mother, and uh, John. John grew to manhood and joined the fire department in 1941. Uh, later became chief, as you'll see in the presentation here. This is when he was a captain. Now as a captain, he was a training officer for his shift, and he, he had a lot of things that he did. He was a professional, I'm sorry, uh, an amateur photographer. And he took hundreds of pictures of Kankakee showing where hydrants were, where the truck should park, uh, where the sprinklers were, all those sorts of things for training programs. And another thing he would do, would, he'd be on duty, and we'd be on duty, and he'd walk to the engine room, and Sonny would holler, ladder drill, and that meant you put on your gear, and jumped on the ladder, took it up on the roof of the building and, and pretended it was a fire. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the uh, transport of persons back in the old days before even there were hospitals. Before hospitals come along, funeral homes were the primary vehicle to move patients someplace. Before hospitals, there's no place to take them. But uh, in those days, and even some of you remember that, the doctors came to your house and made house calls. And for example, in 1906, the Physicians Club of Kankakee came to a decision to charge a night rate of $2.50 for each visit. Extra money if they dispense medicine. So that's the kind of thing that they had back then. Outrageous, $2.50 uh, call. So. Uh, talking about these ambulances, 
when we finally get to that point, this is rare. It was rare when I was a young kid, rare Jones something or the funeral home. Kaiser. Kaiser. Kaiser was, there you go. And, but then it was just rare, and he had this ambulance. Main source of transportation in the early days. Or, you know, if you were, uh, had friends or something, it'd be helpful. But, uh, so you had your first hospital, emergency hospital, is what it was called. Later it's called, what, uh, uh, St. Mary's, Provena, Presence, and that nature. It was built in 1897, northeast corner of uh, Merchant and uh, Fifth, same place it is now, directly across, kind of from the parish house for St. Rose School, or St. Rose, uh, church. The, yeah, the church and the priest house. So uh, it was built at a cost of $12,000. It held 12 patients, and Father Paradis of St. Rose had pushed for it, and uh, they bought a lot at 100 block North Fifth Avenue, right next to Soldier Creek, intending to do it there. And then they decided, well, that's in those days, the sewage control and so forth, it was too much of a bacteria danger, so they kind of canceled that. So a year or so later, then finally they got together and actually did this here. 33 years later, there's an expansion, which is what you see here now, how much more has been added to on down the road. There is either a rare ambulance or another one there in a buggy. The second hospital, this is kind of an interesting story, it's called the Hickok House. It was built in 1884 as a private residence. And then uh, he sold it to uh, another fella in 1869. Uh, and the guy bought the entire, from River Street to the river, the west side of Harrison. He bought that whole stretch of land and he sold the bottom two lots on the river, which are now the Frank Lloyd Wright houses. They built those there then. So this was a private residence until uh, 1903, a guy named Thomas Dreyer bought it, including the house, and with his father-in-law, uh, Dr. Lowenthal from Chicago, established Riverview Hospital. And this is what it was then. They had to do with a scientific branch, basically a psychologist, psychiatrist, a Garfield Park Sanitarium. Uh, this housed 15 patients, and treated local residents on an outpatient basis. In 1909, they converted into a general hospital. And uh, the books will tell you that a lot of famous people from Kankakee were born there, uh, mayors and socialites and so forth. In 1909, that was. Unfortunately, two years later, 1911, they tore it down. It just drives me crazy when you see some of these neat old buildings that they had and, and they tear it down and now there's a couple houses there and so forth. That was the first hospital, or the second hospital, I'm sorry. Third hospital is what's called the Barrett. It was a residence too. Now the interesting story about this was, it was built by an architect, or an architect named Briggs, and he had James Lilly build it for him. James Lilly was responsible for building uh, emergency hospital, arcade building, uh, all the Kanky State Hospital buildings, uh, and a couple other things I can't remember right now. So then, he built it in 1868 for this guy, and then he bought it from him in 1884 for $14,000, had 15 rooms, six Italian white uh, marble places. You see one of them here toward the gift shop. That's one of them. And then in 1914, five siblings named Barrett bought the house from him or from relatives. And uh, one was Josephine, a nurse. And she talked the other siblings into turning into a, a general hospital, which they did, uh, and, and with operating rooms. She died in 1925, and her brother William uh, quit doing that and turned it into what's called a sulfur treatment center. Apparently, it was kind of a spa type of deal. You know, people thought it was very helpful to set in those kind of odors or whatever. And then in uh, uh, 1944. And quit doing it, and then they sold it uh, and tore it down in 1955, another beautiful big old homes, which is now where the Jewish temple is. So just across the street from where that other hospital was. So we talked about uh, places to take the sick and injured and so forth when necessary. We'll, we'll talk a little bit now about things that cause some of these things. This is 100 block north of East Court Street, looking at the Schuyler Avenue and you see all the horses and buggies. So you think about that, and a horse that gets spooked and go crazy and throw people off. 
when I was with the coroner's office, I used to go through the old ledgers. It's interesting to see uh, uh, the types of, of deaths that were caused by that. Well, even firefighters, talking about Chicago Fire. Uh, in, in a period of time, the study I did with them from uh, 1856 to 1996, 582 firefighters died. Uh, and I'm talking about the injuries, just died as we call them fire-related deaths. Uh, and a lot of them were from getting thrown off those fire rigs that you saw earlier and getting run over by the one behind them or the horses and so forth. So that was a big thing there and a big thing here with these people who just had them for transportation and, and work things. So um, a reading from the book of the people by uh, Hood and Classy, it's here. Quote, unnatural death could often be attributed in the early 1900s to one of four causes, railroad accidents, suicide, drowning, or epidemic of contagious diseases. Frequently the victims of railroad tragedies were men and boys who lost limbs when they slipped between the wheels or beneath the wheels of the trains and many died as a result of their, of their injuries. Uh, and that's true because we were pretty much a railroad town in those days. Talking about suicides with the coroner's office, I was amazed looking back at the old books of the number of, well, I can't say suicide, we'll never know. We had the Kanky State Hospital, and you'd have three things would happen. Either uh, one of the residents decided they want to go for a swim and drown, or maybe they wanted to escape and swim across the river and didn't make it, or simply committed suicide. You never really know those three causes, but that happened quite a bit. All right, so now, uh, more things causing trouble. Now we got trolley cars. This is corner of Court and Schuyler looking kind of west. And you got uh, trolley cars, and we're a little bit past the date now. We got automotive vehicles, but you still had uh, the trolley cars spooking the horses and the buggies and uh, resulting mayhem from that, so. Crowds. This is 100 and 200 block of Southeast Avenue with a Kankakee Street Fair. So you've got all these people. Uh, it amazes me, just a little side thing here, that the hat industry, just think about all the hats they sold to the ladies and the men's in those days. You got your trolley cars, and you got overhead uh, wires, electric wires, that, that brought the trolley cars down the road. And then you had the interstate fair. On First Street between Harrison and Indiana Avenue, it dead ended it here, which is second largest county fair only to the state, park, state, uh, state fair in Springfield. So you had all kind of people there you're gonna see. Look at that crowd, 3,000 people those grandstands could hold. And it burned down once and they built it again. And of course, uh, horse racing or buggies, surreys, whatever you wanna call them, were big. There's the, uh, the judges stand and so forth. More pictures of them actually doing it. And again here. This is a very busy day at the fair. Look at all those cars and people, and there's a, a big slide in the background there. I wonder how many people fell off that darn thing. <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, now we still got racing, but now we're going to automotive. Chief Roy Marquardt, as a young man, raced motorcycles here back in the old days. Now, Bird Park Quarry, can you imagine that? Look at the people, 1935. Uh, slide into the water, there was a button here. You know, had a beach there and these, they, you know, a float out here to swim to and stuff. And talking about water, now we're gonna talk about, uh, well this is, I'm sorry, 100 block East Court Street. Again, we got more trolleys running now, so we're up the ante of people getting hurt. Riverview Hotel. Look at the crowds that they brought down from Chicago, especially tourists would come and, and they'd have uh, either uh, Gugger and his boats would bring them here or he had a transportation from the railroad stations. Uh, take a look at that hotel because you're gonna see it a little bit later on in this program and remember how it used to look. Mm -hmm. Now these boats, this is either the, the Clipper or the Modoc. Uh, it's not really the Mini Lily because Mini Lily is a bigger boat and has the big stern wheel on the side and it says Mini Lily on it. but. Uh, this is Sheiky's Landing. Sheiky's Landing was at the foot of Schuyler Avenue. As you come down, you're dead in at the river, 500 block. That, that's where Sheiky's Landing was. And it was the main place for boats to take off from, near the railroad station. And, uh, and then it would go either to uh, like Riverview Hotel or to Cougars or Gugger, his Grove, which is by Roma Park, which is a gigantic place. We don't have any pictures of it here, but 
big dance hall and slides into the river and I just a great place for people to come and party. This is one of another one of the boats, the Chauvigny. It's it's not a bad situation. You'll see what I'm gonna go to next. This carried 300 people supposedly. I you know <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm not riding on it because uh, I think it's overloaded. But now you're looking at the old Kanky State Hospital across the river and the clock tower that's still there. We're going to see in other pictures. And to your right is uh, the water tower, which was taken down over the years. More boats. There's, there's the Margaret again, a little closer picture of the Kanky State Hospital. Actually, it's called the Eastern Illinois Asylum for the Insane. And other people in their boats enjoying a good summer. Now comes winter. What happens, the river freezes, and it just boggles my mind that these, I mean, to me, there's, there's open water. And this isn't safe enough for me. And you see other pictures in other books where they had car races, they had buggies and horses races and all that sort of stuff. You're looking down the river, and I believe that's the Ruby Hotel there. And the State Hospital grounds over in here. It's an Indiana Avenue, standing at uh, Station Street, looking up the hill. So you got your buggies and your surreys or sleds, whatever you call them. Uh, those of you, uh, nobody else heard me, that was, was called Central, well, it was, first, it was the first Kanky High School. And then when I went there in the 40s, it was Central School, and down here they built a new building that was called Departmental. That was the next high school. And then Departmental burned down and they these people here, kids took it over and took this away from us. And we had to go to other schools around town. We used to sled a lot on uh, Chicago Avenue. They'd block it off and to let us slide down to, to Station Street. Now you've got cycling comes into being. These are all unicycles, a kinky cycling club, someplace on Core Street. I'm not sure what the corner, if that's Dearborn or whatever. So then from unicycles, you went to bicycles. Some men and women out in a local park someplace out zooming around. And then who wants to go flying? I think I'll take a pass. Would you trust this guy to take you up in the air, you know? Come on. All right. Okay, industry. You got all different things. You got the railroad we talked about. Kankakee County and area especially had a lot of quarries. This, believe it or not, is a south side quarry on Schuyler Avenue. Because you can see the clock tower off there in the distance. And so you got kind of things where sledgehammer blow injuries, rock chips hitting in the face or eyes, explosions from dynamiting the, the, the stuff down and that. And then you have the Radke Brewery, the foot of Dearborn Avenue. Dearborn comes down to Schuyler. If you go across, I'm sorry, Dearborn to River, you cross the street and on the uh, right side as you walk down there would be uh, the brewery which is here and this is the ice house and there is where uh, uh, administration building some shipping was upstairs a big community building and when i was a kid we used to go we had uh, it was a roller rink we were roller roller skating there but look at these i mean they're hauling ice up into the ice house here's a little kid on on skates zooming around and all these people here some i suppose are workers or others are just you know, bystanders, but the danger that the rivers, you know. Talking about fires, to injuries to firefighters, anything else, uh, in that Chicago fire thing, uh, there were 62 firefighters killed by falling, wall, falling walls. And uh, this is in Kankakee. Uh, there were 20 in one incident alone that got killed with a falling wall in Chicago. This is the, what used to be the Ice House Company on East, no, West uh, Station Street, Route 17, just past Ropers. Very heavily insulated walls to keep the ice from melting that they put in there. And I've had some clunks ask me, what are you doing so far back and should get in and fight the flames? Well, if they knew about these falling walls, if, you know, the proclivity of that happening, then you'd understand there are times when you step back and look at it a little bit and not get carried too far away. Uh, the danger is always there. Only good training, good equipment, and good luck present disastrous results from firefighting. We talked about the Riverview Hotel in its good days. Here's in its bad days. It uh, burned to the ground. All that wood going. Nobody was killed. 
This is Marycrest Fire on East Court Street. Uh, things that happen. I remember uh, this is a little before this got to this point. We were told that this unnamed lawyer had an office upstairs in there, and he was a drinker, and there's a very good chance he had set the fire, had fallen asleep, or whatever. So uh, Captain Till and I went in to look for him. Well, by then it started to burn through the roof, and we had the aerial set up with a hose line coming down from it, and it came through. They swung it around and got Dettillo and I, and we were soaking wet and very cold. So, you know, the old saying stuff happens. Uh, okay, we've talked a lot about uh, injuries, destruction, and death being thrown at you. I'll take, tell you a couple stories about the fire department. I think you all have fire buffs that hang around the station, come and visit. And uh, this belongs to one of our teenagers, Lance was his name. Long hair, thick glasses, nice kid. And he liked us so much he bought all his own gear. He had a, he had a helmet, he had the fire coat, he had the boots, uh, thigh high boots, red or uh, orange uh, rubber gloves. So one day we had a, we had a silent alarm to uh, Alden's store. And as the, the, the deal was then, you, you put a hose line from the journal building over to the sprinkler in the alley. It turned out to be nothing. So we're picking up the hose. Well, on the street in front on Merchant Street, Chief Marnell was facing west toward the IC Depot talking with the manager who was facing east. And suddenly the manager says, oh, well, looks like one of you guys missed a truck. Here he comes on his bicycle. <laughs> it was Lance. And Marnell said, Damn it all, he threw his hat to the ground and said, that man is banned from the fire department. <laughs> and he was for a couple, three weeks and he got over it and he got to come back again, so. The other was we had a, a, a call of smoke showing in, in, uh, on Jeffrey Street, a store that was there. Now, a really good firefighter, we'll just call him Billy, uh, was at, uh, a really good guy. Uh, the, his trouble was he had kind of a medical condition that he had to live with, which necessitated his going to the restroom a little bit often than one might expect. He was at number two station, he and the driver, and, and, and this rang out, they were closer, so they got there first and they raided back, smoke showing, but no flames. And so Billy made entry with a hose line, and uh, so we arrived at engine one, to, Captain Dottillo was uh, the officer, and I was riding the tailboard and our driver would pull up. And we see the hose line extended, so we got our flashlights, put on our Scots, you know, because there was smoke coming out of the doors. Uh, and we followed the hose line in, following our way through. And finally it stops, there's a nozzle. Where's Billy? Well, there's a door ajar here. And we open it, and there's Billy sitting on the, he found the seat of the fire. Oh, not the seat of the fire, but the seat of, the stool. of the stool, yeah. And there he is, full gear, passed down on his fire boots, fire coat hooked up around his hips, full Scott air pack in the tank, and the mask in the face. And we shine his lights in his face, and he says, I, I'm okay, I'll go in a minute. So we backed out and, and picked up the hose, went on in and found a big thing burning us. So uh, you, you had to be there. You, really had, you, had, you had to be there with that. Yeah. I always told Billy, I said, you should write a book on restrooms I've known and loved. I said, you'd make a fortune there with the tourist industry. So, All right, back to the serious line here. Talking about, we, we've identified hospitals, we've identified causes for uh, things to happen. Medical transport, how are you gonna get them there? Well, this is an actual bus company on North Schuyler Avenue, that's in Kankakee, uh, 1890. And if, if your patient was, a relative was ambulatory and, and so forth, and could ride in either the family vehicle, you know, where is it at there? Or call the bus people or get them to your house and take you to the hospital, which only one be in, uh, uh, say, uh, emergency at that time there. If you had a disaster situation, you need all kind of vehicles, this is what would be appropriate, I suppose, any kind of thing that would be able to lay a patient on a stretcher or whatever and take them to the hospital. And I said about hearses, this is a, an, another funeral home at a funeral, a wakes they always had in those days at your own house at least, uh, easily converted into an ambulance to, to transport the patient. Now, in, uh, let me find my date here. 1917, 100 block East Merchant, arcade building in the background there. Taxi company, again, if you're ambulatory and, and you know, got your means to get there, call these guys here and they're gonna take you to where you need to go. 
in later years, um, and where am I at here, 1917, same area looking the other way toward the IC depot, you got these more taxis available to you. If you could afford a car or a friend with a car, this is Fortin's on uh, 300 block of East Court Street. Uh, that was in 1910, selling cars and, and that's another way you could get there. Eventually, as time passes, we find that uh, the need to offer more public, greater access to medical aid or movement to hospitals comes into the picture. So now we get an EMS, for those who don't know, emergency medical systems or service. In the 1940s, a local junior women's club donated to Kanki Fire Department, it was called the ENJ Resuscitator or Inhalator. And the deal with it is, uh, I had a dial on top here and the two oxygen tanks and you could, three choices, you could turn it on and simply dispense oxygen to the patient or uh, you could hold it tightly to their face, and I mean tightly, to make it work and it would uh, put so many ounces of oxygen in, remove so many, supposedly to allow those in the lungs to go out to the circulatory system, which is fine if the person's heart is breathing. And uh, I remember even being taught as a kid or at Cenobot, remember the old arm lift method of uh, resuscitation, you'd raise the arms up, the musculature would allow the air to flow into your lungs and come down and blow it back out again. But again, if your heart isn't beating, it's not doing much good at all. So now we've got this thing here and nothing to haul it in, so you take it on the engine. Well, the public wasn't very knowledgeable about wanting them until they finally learned, hey, we can you know, call the end later is what they would say eventually. Mm -hmm. So they bought a 1948 Dodge vehicle, which was built at a moments manufacturing outfit, and it's called a squad, and that's where I argue with the guys about why it's called a squad, because a squad is a vehicle that carries equipment to a fire. And so what you have is, for example, there's a better picture of it later, but uh, uh, there's a big uh, floodlights the, on, on the top and there's a generator inside to run them. There's, there's a loudspeaker that the captain could or the chief could shout orders to you over it instead of the old bullhorns. So this is Chief Roy Markworth there in, in the white hat on the right taking uh, delivery of it. Another view of it, you can see the equipment on top that you know when you went to a fire and you took it, well you also had to carry the ENJ in it. And, uh, but in the, the back door is a narrow hallway with the folding cloth, well, canvas, army stretcher. And really the thought was for, if we get hurt at a fire, we've got something to move them to the hospital in. But then again, the public started learning about, hey, they've got this E&J on board and they'll be calling us. And all they would say is send in later and we would have to go. Now, uh, if I know him, I know, couldn't, I don't know. I'd have to sit and think. Uh, is that okay? Right. Yeah, there. Yeah, Art. Yeah, there's Tom. Uh, Art. Yeah, Tom. There. Matt in the middle. Yeah, Matt. And I don't know. It's before my time. <laughs> Here they are actually working on a patient just for inhalation because he's not holding it tightly to the face. Now, what was bad about this deal is, being a rookie or younger guy, the two of us would go and you notice the hats that we wore. You had to have a hat on in in your equipment. Uh, get to the house, the person was dead. You didn't have cardiac pulmonary resuscitation, this is what you did. Well, so you'd hold it, I'd have to hold it tightly to their face. He would go out and get a big tank and bring in, hook it up to that and leave in case you had another call. And there I'd be waiting because in those days the doctors would come, they'd call the doctor and the doctor would come to the house. See, when he got there, and then the doctor would examine the patient, find no pulse, something said, that's it, he's dead. And it turned it off, his chest went down, and the relatives were all standing there watching, thinking they're alive, and, the, and we got the hell out of there. I mean, we loaded ourselves up, and, you know. I, it, it was a sad situation, but that's, that's the way things were. Yeah, true story. Uh, this shows squad eight at uh, ambulance eight, whatever you wanna call it, at a flood scene, just doing other things than what one would expect. Actually, I rode in as a patient in the front seat when I was 15, we got in a car wreck and uh, they came and got us. And... Now, so then we go to the next vehicle, uh, which is Squad One. Let me find where my, I'll get some dates here if I can find them here. 1957 GMC Gerstenschlager being delivered to the fire department 
cost $6,400, and a local junior women's club donated half the money, $3,240. As it became necessary to uh, consider a larger transport vehicle, that's my dad. Uh, there's a Gershon Schlager at an accident scene. Obviously, it was a, what it was, and they're putting the victim into the squad. Now we've got helmets to wear. It's our training helmets. And I tell you what, if Mark was anywhere around, he was at every call of any kind that came up. If it was a, almost a, a garbage fire in the alley, he was helping out and checking. He always said, it, 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 I never asked my people to do something that I haven't done or wouldn't do. There's another accident scene, uh, a motorcycle there, collision of some sort, a crash, and there was a stretcher. Now the stretchers in those days, you guys should be happy about, they didn't do anything but roll along the ground. You had to pick the patient up off the floor or whatever, put them on the stretcher, get to the hospital, lift them up off the stretcher, up on the hospital bed, or we took a lot of patients directly to their room in those days too. And then finally, later on, they got wise and bought stretchers that would actually do something more than just elevate the head. There they're loading the patient in the ambulance. Now we're wearing our training helmets. I believe that's Inspector Gimo on the left of the picture there. And apparently he was at a fire and got called uh, to take the ambulance run that, you remember the all with the scoop stretcher? Ricardo? Hello. Huh? <laughs> right there. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where are we at here? Okay, now, some really serious stuff happened. Some appropriate response to difficult calls. This was that American Marietta, which is known what, Valspar. And that tank, this company from out of state was hired to empty the water out, clean the inside, and then to, for repainting it inside. And the cleaning material they were used was highly, as it turns out, inflammatory. This fellow, young guy, thank God he was only in there alone when it happened. It's him there, uh, right there. Uh, a bulb swung, broke, kawoomp. He was in a gigantic fireball inside there. We got called, all response, there's the aerial set up. They went up and got him. He was ambulatory and conscious, thank goodness. There had been a heck of a deal, put him on a stretcher and lowering it so as not to lose him on the way. And they put him on a stretcher, standing there, Fireman Jack Cooper standing behind him, strapping him in so he wouldn't fall, bringing him down, and there he is. Chief Marquardt. We're ready. Uh, horrible burns, he died a couple days later. Oh, jeez, I wondered. Take him to the hospital. West Kankee Annex, you heard him talking about that. Uh, 1967. Well, they had to give up all their gear, so it still says West Kankakee, as you can see there. And uh, Chief uh, John Marquardt is taking uh, the license plate and keys from Chief uh, Moss of, of West Kankakee Fire Department. What was, I loved it because it was small, smaller than the GMC Gerstenschlager, but it had an automatic transmission. God damn, that was nice. <laughs> that was nice. And there it is. Now we've repainted it to, to our name. And there it is in business. So nice little truck for now. Now, there's inside. Here we're unloading at uh, Riverside. You notice the nurses' uniforms in those days, the white socks and all of that. That's, uh, that's me and uh, Coleman in my heavier days. Okay, I'm gonna, this is my my deal here. Uh, again, we needed the newer type. This nationally is called a modular ambulance. The thought being that uh, you build the box the way you want it, and it's put on a, a pickup truck frame, and then the pickup truck goes to heck. You just take the box off and put it on another frame, and you're still in business. Uh, uh, Assistant Chief Gima and I went to several departments around the state looking at the, the vehicles they had, getting some ideas of how we would want them. I remember one department had one where the guys with the stretchers, the floor come out, well then it sloped down so that as your wheels hit right there, it was an easy thing of, of sliding them in further. That was one type. So uh, I sat down and uh, Inspector Foster helped me out and these guys helped me out and drew the specs for this. 
Uh, we applied for a grant, state grant, and it, it was, we got it. And this is a Modulance company in Dallas, Texas. They got the bid. Assistant Chief uh, Abney and I flew to Dallas, got a tour of the factory, and drove it back. You'll notice a big orange stripe. The reason for that is because we're gonna get an orange in a little bit about the EMT books. Uh, that was mandated by the state. When you got a grant, you had to do this color scheme. But how you wanted your compartments, for example, right behind, uh, like I said, I drew the specs for it, and right behind him is a long cabinet, and that's where we put our fire gear, so you didn't have to sit on it on the seats and stuff. And then other things with different materials or parts that we wanted. Carried four, <laughs> I gotta go next picture. Carried four patients, and several times we put four patients in it. And you didn't, have any, you didn't call for an engine to help you in those days. You did what you did. And I mean, obviously, uh, the four were not in critical condition. We never would have done it, but you hung two from the ceiling. I was say. On a stretcher. Come on, on a stretcher. <laughs> on a stretcher. Come on. And, uh, and then on, on the seat here was another one. And then th that natural stretcher there. And we had an, like an accident with a little car wreck, and the, it was all teenagers and all. It was all my head hurts, my bump this. So they, all four of them took them into the hospital. Okay, so over the years, they've changed vehicles. I mean, you keep buying newer ones. Uh, different styles, different colors. Now the orange, this is the first edition of the EMT book in 73 when I, we took the course here. Uh, 260 some pages in this one. Uh, today's book is the 10th edition, 1500 pages. pages. I gotta tell you, as long as we're on this point about these guys also happy about having a consecutive, I gotta name mine. So there was great grandpa John one, that's first. Uh, number two was his son Roy Marquez, number two. His son was John the second, number three. Uh, number four was me, four. Now that's fire department connection. But if you add fire service connection, my son, built fire trucks for Saudi Arabia, so that's number five. Number six in Cincinnati is getting his EMT training now. And Alice, <laughs> you talked about the, let's uh, uh, think about, uh, uh, the gas truck that burned up on Station Street. She rode in the hospital and they took him in, the driver. So that's six in a row. So. Uh, CPR was invented or devised, what do you want to call it? And here they're showing how it's done. The, the model is Rosessa Annie, uh, a model of the doctor that come up with this, his 13-year-old daughter, who died when no one was available to help perform this new invention on her. And uh, our department still shows it around, I guess, or for classes. Okay. It's time for Chief Young to take over and finish up the program. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Thank you. Right. Yeah. You want this? Sure. Figure it out there. You always get more than what you bargained for from Tommy McVeigh. The reason, um, we have this slide up here. It's because that's our patch. If you look back, all these young men and women are wearing it today. You've worn it, and it means something. All right, Tom McVeigh, along with, the, some, with Billy Foster, came up with this design. And on this patch, everything means something, OK? I'm going to read this to you. We have this hanging in our, at every single one of our stations. And it's about the Kanky Fire Department patch. And it just says, in 1969, Lieutenant Tom McVeigh, with the input from Assistant Chief Bill Foster, des designed our present uh, service emblem. The two believed that the emblem used at the time didn't acknowledge our true devotion and service to the Kanky Fire Department. Eventually, they were able to convince Chief John Marcourt and the majority of the firefighters of the need to adopt its conversion. And if you look at it, you have the never-ending red line. And I'll get back to that in a minute. 
you have a broken red line, which symbolizes the ill, injured, and the fallen members of our department. You have the United States Eagle, shows the devotion to our country and to our fellow citizens. And you have the blue lines, blue hose lines in the background is blue, which indicates uh, water, which is our primary extinguishing agent. You have the crosshead pickhead axe there, which uh, denotes the tools of our trade. You have the Maltese cross located in the bottom, which represents the internationally recognized sign of firefighters. Again, the never-ending red line, which demonstrates our ongoing and continued service to our community, which holds everything else inside here together. That's what that patch means. That's why we wear it on our shoulder. I'm proud to wear it. Thank you, Judy. I'm very proud to wear it. I'm proud to, to know that uh, what it means and where it comes from, Tom, and then what a great job that you did with that, of course. On our, if you look at the polos here, and I got my butt a little chewed because I excluded the never-ending red line. <laughs> that's changing. I already got two shirts ordered, and that's coming. Right. So you know, the uh, so I want to thank all of you for what you've done here, and for all of you for coming here and listening to it. I, it you wouldn't be here if it didn't mean something to you. And we truly are, uh, you know, a firefighting family. Uh, once a firefighter, always a firefighter, and so on and so forth. There's a lot to it. Uh, we, you know, I want to expand this into, you know, doing the the, the into individual firefighters, lieutenants, uh, captains, and just you could move on with this. I noticed I want you to come into my office, Leroy, because I saw how quick you identified those three firefighters in that picture. <laughs> we could, uh, we, uh, just a, Chief Harmon retired has built a huge bank of pictures. If you have pictures, bring them in. We will scan them and put them in our vault, if you will, and identify them. And the more of history that we get, the more we, uh, things that we have, the more things that we can appreciate, and then we know our heritage and uh, where, our, where our traditions in the Kanky Fire Department come from. Yes. Okay. One more thing, uh, just uh, Lieutenant Stick, would you please stand? There is our first female firefighter and our first female officer. We've come a long way, and this isn't your grandfather's fire department anymore. Uh, and so we're, we're really proud of it, and I hope that you guys in the back um, really appreciated the program because I know I did. And thanks for coming. And thanks, Roberta, for everything that you did for us to do this. Dave, you know, Dave, for putting up with these three guys on a nonstop basis. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, Ron Homburg had his stuff done two weeks before the deadline. All right? <laughs> Chief, uh, Chief Gimo kept tweaking it all the way down until yesterday. <laughs> All right? And he had his all typed up and his all typed up. We typed it up for Ron. And um, Tom wrote his stuff out and said, here you go. If you want to use it, fine. I don't care what you do. <laughs> but uh, it was a unique experience working with these. And if any of you have any further ideas uh, for future programs, by all means, uh, let me know. And we'll work on, on what we can do about it. And you're all welcome at the fire stations anytime you want. All right? Look at these guys so that you know them, so that um, they know who you are when you come. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you.